Six verses have been on my mind this morning, and I trust that the Lord will bless us as we consider these things. And it's uh, probably familiar ground to us. If you have Bibles and you want to turn to Psalm number one, Psalm one. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Six verses. And a lot to be said, but I uh, will share with you some of the things that have been on my heart while I've been thinking about these verses, and pray the Lord will bless it, and we'll have Brother Mark come forward. As we read through those first two verses, it occurs to me that there is a progression here. Yes. All right. And David starts off by stating a true fact. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Plain fact. There's blessing in walking after and following after the Lord, and in doing what He calls us to do, which is entirely and in every way opposed to the way of the world. And that's what's described in the next few phrases. The man, there is a walking, there is standing, and there is sitting. I got to thinking about that. Walking, obviously, is an activity. There, the counsel of the godly uh, is, and, and I was reading a little bit in Proverbs 2, uh, where Solomon was writing, and Solomon is David's son, uh, where he was writing about, uh, go not into the way of the ungodly, those who call for, uh, destro- for uh, destroying and, and tra- entrapping those who, are, uh, those who are righteous. So if we turn quickly over to the book of Proverbs, verse 10 says, My son, this is Proverbs chapter 1, My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. So David had taught Solomon something, and Solomon, in writing this proverb, was repeating what he had learned from his father. Now, the, the, the thing to all, I, I think to remember, though not to take away from these, the wise words that these men had to say, is that neither one of these men was flawless in every way. They, all, they both had their problems. We all have our problems. But it doesn't negate the wisdom that God can grant to each and every one of us to know what we ought to do and to counsel others in the right way. Amen. And Solomon here says, Do not consent in the way of sinners. If they entice thee, consent thou not. If they say, Come with us. Let us lay wait for blood. Let us lurk privily, privately for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them up alive as the grave and whole as those that go down into the pit. We shall find all precious substance. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Cast in thy lot among us. Let us all have one purse. My son, walk not thou in the way with them. Refrain thy foot from their path. So there's this call from the world to do uh, ungodly and unrighteous things. Uh, just just a little bit of, of transgression, just a little bit of compromise, just a little bit of this, a little bit of leaven, and, but, but it'll all work out okay. We will prosper. We will find riches and substance for ourselves, and we'll uh, take out the righteous, the ones that stand in our way. That's uh, walking in the counsel of the ungodly. Solomon says, don't consent to that. David here says, the man, the man is blessed if he does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, to take up the activity of the cry of the unrighteous and the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners. Now, now there's a little bit of laziness involved, I, I suppose. Uh, for the, there's, a, there's, a, there's comfort to a degree in, in standing. You've walked, you've partaken of the activity, you have engaged in the counsel of the wicked and the ungodly, you have uh, done as they have uh, uh, directed and suggested, now you're standing there, you're a little more comfortable with what, what they have said. This year's, here's where I'm going to 
place my flag, so to speak. This is where I'm going to begin to rest in this ungodly counsel and in this unrighteousness. I've compromised a little bit, and it's gotten comfortable to me, so I'm going to stand right here. This seems good, a good place to, to stand, and then to sit in the seat of the scornful. Now there's the, the final and the ultimate resting. You've sat down. Full justification for the counsel of the ungodly. Uh, complete acceptance of what the unrighteous is calling for and what they are suggesting. Sitting down, resting, and taking up uh, leisure in this ungodly counsel and in this unrighteousness. But now there's activity back because you're sitting in the seat of the scornful. This is sitting down and resting, comfortable in, in the place of, uh, of ungodliness and of wickedness, of uh, disobedience and contrariness to the Lord and to His Word. And now you're taking up mockery of those who are still undertaking to walk in a righteous way. Right. You're sitting in the seat of the scornful. You are resting in your... In, 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 this description here is uh, describing somebody who's now sat down and taken rest in an ungodly place in a wicked place, and now they're making those who are seeking to walk according to the ways of righteousness and of God. They are, uh, look at those poor rubes who think that serving God makes any difference. How foolish are they that they should uh, try to walk in, an, uh, in a righteous way, believing that God will somehow bless them. How ridiculous, how, how silly it is to try and de to deny themselves. It makes no difference anyway. Frankly, this was kind of, Job's response yeah. when he got fed up with the challenges and the trials that he was undergoing, he said, what good does it do to serve God anyway? The righteous and the wicked, they both die and everything is lost. What good is it? And God calls him to account for that and Job eventually repents of it, but that's sitting in the seat of the scornful, resting in that ungodly place and now mocking those who are seeking to walk in the way that the righteous are called to walk. David says, blessed is the man that doesn't do any of these things. There's blessing and obedience. There is a goodness and, and nourishment, which we'll get to in just a moment, in walking in the ways that God has established. There is safety, there is liberty, and there is freedom in those ways. So the scornful will say, how silly and ridiculous it is for somebody to deny themselves and to restrict themselves in such a fashion when there is no good or benefit from it. And the blessing comes to the man who sees the long-term view. I think that's the difference between what, is, uh, what David is presenting here. There's a, a, a man that's going to be described here like a tree who has a long-term view, who understands that this world and the things of this world have no substance. And it'll come up again in this psalm. They have no weight. They are not as important as the things that God has for us. And, uh, and so the, the delight for the man that is blessed is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. This, this one's where I fall down at. I was talking to somebody last night, and I said one of the challenges that we face is there are so many other things that capture our attention. There are things that are a responsibility of ours to take care of and to care for and to see through. There are other things that are a, a pleasure and a leisure. They also can take some of our attention, and such is there's no, nothing wrong with those things. But what I was trying to, re, to relay to uh, this individual that I was talking to was the problem we've got is <clears throat> those other things some that require our attention because they're responsibilities of ours and some things which we enjoy to do because we all like leisure and we all need rest. Sometimes uh, those kinds of things and other things take up all of the time available until we finally get to a point where we are at, uh, where, where we're left with nothing else to say, but uh, I'll, I'll read the Bible later. Yeah. I, don't, I don't have time. I'll, I'll pray tomorrow. It'll be fine. God, God won't mind. The delight is in meditating upon it day and night, keeping it in front of our minds, making it a part of our regular daily habits. That's where the blessing is. 
because in that way we can avoid the things that David says uh, the, the, we ought to avoid. Uh, blessed is the man that doesn't do these things. We can identify, recognize, and discern those things if we've been meditating in the law, if we have put the Word of God before our minds, if we have read it and we have digested it, if we have taken it in as part of our daily understanding about how the world works. You know, God made the world. And if anybody knows how things work, what's good and what's right, if anyone knows what's truly real, then surely it would be the one who created it. And don't we want to know and understand what's real and how the world works? Where can we go to but the source, which is God? He's the one who has all the wisdom. He's the one who has all the knowledge. Our delight, our joy, the filling of our hearts comes from keeping the Word of God before us. How many times have we faced a challenge and a scripture comes to mind? And it has been a comfort to us or a strength to us. That's what we're talking about. That's what David is referring to here. The blessed man, the one who is favored by God. That's one of the ways we understand the word blessing. The one who is favored by God is one who keeps the word, the law of God, before their minds all the time, day and night. Now There are, certain, there, there are things, as I say, that demand our attention, that are requirements for my efforts and my activity. I have to take care of my family because God gave them to me to take care of. And that responsibility takes time and it takes effort. But I also have to make time for the God who gave me the family to take care of. That's what David is talking about here. Those responsibilities that we have demand our attention. But the one who gave us those responsibilities and gives us the strength to do what is necessary to be done also ought to be part of our affection and a source or, or a, a, an object of our love and our effort. To delight in the law of God is one of the blessings that we enjoy from God. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. When I read these things and I look at the language, I always try to understand why God phrased things this way. And one of the things I noticed is that the tree was planted, which is to say that somebody took the tree and put it by the river. The tree didn't do it on its own. Didn't make the decision to pluck itself up from wherever it was and go walk over to where the river is and then dig down its roots. That's not how that works. Somebody planted the tree by the river. I wonder who that could be. Who's giving the blessings? Whose law are we to delight in? I think we have found the planter. God does the planting. Amen. He's the one who puts the trees by the river. He made the trees, he made the river. And he made the river so that it might nourish the tree. God does the planting. Right. The tree planted by the rivers of water, that's the description that David has for the one who is blessed. There's a lot for us to consider here, but just briefly let us consider that the tree, as it is planted by the river, is receiving nourishment receiving refreshment, receiving drink from the river. So God has taken the time and made the effort to put that tree in a place where it can be nourished and where it can prosper because its fruit is born in due season. Uh, they bring it forth his fruit in his season. I got to think about fruit trees too. Sometimes I think out, out here in the back, we've had some apricot trees, some other trees, and uh, it's a really pretty sight to see. And it doesn't necessarily have to be true uh, uh, fruit either. It, it can be flowers too. So you, you think about uh, an apricot tree or a pear tree or an apple tree and how it blooms when it is the proper season for it to bloom after receiving the sunlight and the water for its nourishment, after getting nourishment from the soil. The flowers bloom. They're so pretty. And then uh, by some means that God created, those flowers uh, begin to bear a fruit and it comes out as an apple or a pear or some other, or an apricot or some other fruit. 
But even if it doesn't turn into a, a fruit in that sense, it's still beautiful when you're driving around here in Oklahoma City to see the dogwoods in bloom or the redwood trees, the myrtle trees. The fruit bearing in its season, when it is the appropriate time for it to bear, when the conditions are right and, and the time established for those fruit to be born comes, the fruit is born according to the strength and to the nourishment and to the prosperity of that tree. See, David is bringing all of this to bear when he's describing the blessed man, the one who delights in the law of the Lord day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of waters, receiving nourishment from the hand of God, refreshment and encouragement and strength and all those things that are necessary for the fruit to be born in its appropriate time, when the conditions are right, when it is the set time for that fruit to be born. And to uh, expand out on that then, the, the man who is blessed by God will find that God will be his nourishment. The law of God and His Word is like the rivers of waters that are refreshing and nourishing to Him. And the, the activities and the actions and the efforts that, that we put forward in the service of God are the fruits that we bear to His name and for His glory at the time which is appointed for Him so that He might receive the most praise and the most glory for nourishing us and providing the conditions so that we might serve Him and bear fruit to His honor and His glory. The ungodly are not so. Well, I'll back up and finish the, the verse. Uh, his leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. That God provides that nourishment in the exact right amount at the exact right time to the exact degree necessary to bring forth fruit to His honor and His glory, so that the, He might have all the praise. The, tr the, the leaves not withering is to say that in all seasons, at whatever time uh, you might consider, and at whichever time you might come upon that tree or that servant, you will find that the servant is watered, that is nourished, is encouraged and is strengthened. It would be quite a marvel for us to go out in the middle of December somewhere here in Oklahoma City and look upon a tree uh, that normally doesn't have green leaves at that time of year and find that it has green leaves. We might, we might almost call it a miracle, but at the very least we would have to say that that tree must be in such a condition at such a time that it is still growing. It is still flourishing. It is still alive uh, visibly to our eyes. The nourishment that the blessed man receives from God nourishes him in all seasons. And he flourishes and all that he does prospers because God has put him in a place that provides the strength and the nourishment that he needs. That's all of this comes together, I, I think, it, because we're talking about this image of a tree being planted by the rivers of water. So I submit it for your consideration. Think about what it means to be a tree planted by the rivers of water and what that means for us. David goes on and says, The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away, because the chaff is what's left over after the beginning processes of milling grain, wheat, and so forth. It's the the husks and the fine straws and, and so forth. That's what's left over. And it has no substance and it has no weight. When we read in the Old Testament, we'll find sometimes that the description of it is that it's uh, trodden out by, by the ox in, in, in the place where they've set aside for doing that milling and that uh, processing of the grain. And uh, if I remember correctly, there's even a description of a, a winnowing fan. Or at least they put those places where they're beginning the milling uh, to be in a place where the wind blows so that it can blow away the chaff, leaving behind the grain, which has the weight and the substance in it. The ungodly are like that weightless, insubstantial, useless chaff. That's all they are. When I get to thinking about that, I think to myself, then why in the world am I so bothered by all of the things that the wicked do if they are so insubstantial and useless. Why do I get so twisted up? 
The ungodly are not like a tree with deep roots, able to withstand storms and winds that blow. And I had this, and I had this thought too while I was considering that. Yeah, you know, here in Oklahoma, uh, there are some uh, <clears throat> there are some times where the winds blow very strongly. And trees will get damaged. But if you notice that a lot of times, and the analogy falls apart a little bit because uh, we live in a sin-cursed world, but a lot of times, if you just take off what's been damaged, the tree will regrow. Why is that? Because it has received the necessary nourishment and strengthening from the natural environment so that it can regrow what was lost. We're like that sometimes. Because it's not always the case that we come through every storm unscathed. But what a blessing it is when we are damaged by the trials that we face, that God strengthens us and gives us the nourishment we need so that we can grow again. What a blessing. But the ungodly, they're not like that. They don't have those deep roots. They're not as stable and as solid as the tree that is planted by the waters. They are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Every wind of doctrine drives them around. Every lust, every desire moves them from place to place because they have no roots. They, have, they are insubstantial and they have no uh, grounding in anything that is solid or that is real. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. It is because the ungodly are not rooted and not grounded in what is nourishing and what is sustaining that they are like the chaff, insubstantial, and moved about with like the wind. The ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. Now, I got to thinking about this one, and it occurred to me that there was a parable which the Lord Jesus told where he describes uh, the Lord, a Lord who had sowed grain in his fields. And then uh, when he and his servants arose at the time of harvest, they found amongst the grain tares that had also been sowed. I think that is a description of what we face here in the world, that even amongst God's people, there are those who... Uh, are, uh, are not dressed in the right garments to borrow from another parable. They are those who are amongst God's people, and, and Jesus describes this in the parable. They are allowed, the tares are allowed to grow up because the servants ask, well, Master, should we root them up? No, leave them. And at the time of harvest then, it is all harvested, and the grain is set aside in its in its place, and the tares, they're cast into the fire and burned. There's a separating between the two. So what does it mean then for sinners not to be standing in the congregation of the righteous? Well, I think that, again, has a long-term uh, point of view. There will not be a time when all is finished and when judgment has come, because that's the other statement here, and so I have to take that into consideration when we're considering this. When judgment comes, when there is to be that point in time set aside by God according to His purpose, when, uh, when the, the sin of this world and the ungodliness and the wickedness is to be judged by an almighty and a righteous God, there will not be a case where somebody slips through. There won't be a, a, a situation where somebody skates by because God knows. He knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Which goes back to that psalm that we sang, which is from Psalm 42, for those of you who don't know. Why does my soul get so cast down why am I so terrified by the things that are in the world? They're like the chaff that the wind is going to blow away. They have no substance and they're useless for anything. But God takes care for His people and provides for them 
refreshing waters and nourishing places where they can grow and where they can prosper. Blessed is the man who does not the things of the ungodly, but is like a tree planted by the rivers of water, who has roots, who is grounded, who is solid and established in those things which are good and strengthening and nourishing. And the ungodly, they are insubstantial and not worthy of concern. And in the day of judgment, God knows the righteous. He knows whom he has cared for and whom he has loved. And they will be blessed and they will be taken into his blessed presence and the ungodly shall perish. Another, another psalm, another word of encouragement from David, who had his share of trials and was himself a flawed man, but he understood something and he delighted in it. And he shared that with his people and God preserved it for us so that we could be encouraged and nourished by waters which are refreshing, the true word of God. Let us find rest, not in the ungodly things, but by the waters which are nourishing and strengthening. Let us delight in the law of God and find strength with him, the great gardener who provides all that we need and encourages us with just what is necessary so that we might prosper and bear forth fruit to his glory. May God be praised. Take from the Word of God and what Brother Mark has brought before us to understand that the Bible commands us to, to delight in His law and to meditate upon it. And this morning, if I had just uh, the Lord's blessing for a short period of time to share something with you, I would try to tie into that, that the, the delight of the law of God and the meditation thereof that the Bible commands us to undertake is your responsibility to do and my responsibility to do. And as I've thought about some a particular passage of Scripture that has come up in conversation here recently among some folks in the lunchroom and elsewhere, I'll try to share with you what's on my heart this morning. But ultimately, let's not lose sight, of course, of what Brother Mark has brought before us, which is the Word of God is our teacher. We are taught by the book, and we are commanded to engage ourselves in an understanding of that. No one is going to do that for you. The way that God has set up his kingdom is somebody may give you some insight. Iron may sharpen iron, but our responsibility to understand the scripture belongs to us and us alone. That idea of our responsibility before God is something that I will try to emphasize one of the two thoughts that I'm going to try to emphasize here as I stand before you for just a short while from the, a very significant event that happened in the history of Israel and it is recorded for us in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 8. This is a very significant event as I've already mentioned because here is a transition in the way society functioned under the Old Testament uh, Israel. It is, it, is a, it is a transition from a judges to a king. This idea, this transition has a lot of implications. I'm going to highlight, I, I think, just a couple. But it's contained right here in 1 Samuel chapter 8. Now, to understand where we are in the history of these people and the way their society function, you have to have some understanding of the book of Judges and and even preceding that, how these people came to the place that they lived in. And so God brought them from Egypt. They, they wandered for 40 years because of some disobedience. They ultimately, after that generation died, go into the land of Canaan. And they begin to possess this land that God had promised them. Whenever you hear somebody talk about the promised land, uh, they're usually referring to the, the land of Israel uh, east, uh, east of the, the Salt Sea, and, and, and uh, I'm sorry, west of the, salt, the, the Dead Sea, and, and east of the Mediterranean, in that general area, were basically where they are today, although in these days it included much more territory than they have today. But there they are, God's promised this land to them, and they go in and they start to possess it. 
And so they begin to establish their society in this land. But the way society functioned, the way God set it up, was, is generally contained in the book of Judges. And in the book of Judges, you'll read that there is a tabernacle, and they have the law of God, and they, 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 their society is run by those things. And if you had a problem or, or you had some disagreement with somebody, you wouldn't go to the county courthouse. You would take it up to the tabernacle, and there the priests could decide your case. So that was the way it functioned. But as we recognize civiliz civilization, how civilization works is there was, by and by, there were threats to the, the populace. And so what God would do would he would raise up a judge. Now, these were not people who had public office. These weren't people who were even really all that well known until God's Spirit came upon them and raised up a judge. And then what this judge would do, would he would have, quite frankly, sudden conviction about the situation they were in, the, the people, and say, it's time to gather together, to rally around, to repent of our sins, and to go and to throw off this oppression. And that's the way it happened. For hundreds of years, that's the way it happened. Now, what I want to submit to you is, that's the way God set it up. That, that wasn't an accident. That's the way God set things up. There wasn't a king. In 1 Samuel chapter 8 is where we find the people begin to cry or insist that they have a key. What I'm talking about is before that. And so here are these, here you th just think about living in a society where there is no standing army, uh, there is no, no elected uh, commander in chief. It's, it's society functions the way I described and Disputes among the people were decided the way I described. But as far as, as defending the country, it was done like that. Now, a lot, of, in fact, every time, I guess, that I could think of that the people were oppressed in the book of Judges because they had, they had sinned. God would protect them as long as they were faithful. But if they were unfaithful, then God would lower the hedge and, and <coughs> in would come some opposing army and afflict them. And they would remain in that condition of oppression for 10, 20, 30, 40 years, long time. So you think about living 40 years under uh, a slice of the United States, living for 40 years under the rule of another country. And that was, you were born in that and you grew up and you lived for, a, for decades like that. And then by and by, the people would repent and cry out to God. Uh, sometimes that would precede the judge. Sometimes the judge would precede the other thing, that, that he, he would call upon the people to repent. And so God would, would finally raise up somebody who had five years before not been raised up. You think about that. What was the difference between the judge saying enough is enough and that same person who was a judge a year before not saying enough is enough? It was God's grace. God looked down upon his people who were oppressed and said, all right, I'm going to put the stop to this, and he would put the, the, the conviction of the Holy Spirit in that person's heart. That person would have courage, and then the people would hear what that person said. Yeah, let's do this, and then that's how God took care of the problem. And that happened for hundreds of years, about 400 years. And you think about that. That, that setup, that scenario, is one where it's the people... Every now and again, as a judge, and he rises to pop, he rises to, to 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 leadership, and then he dies, and there isn't someone immediately to take that person's place. As I said, this is not public office, and the people would continue on with their daily lives for some time. Who who was running the country at that time? It was the law of God and God Himself. God was the king. He was the one who, who, who reigned over Israel. And so there was no intermediary between the people and God. Well, that happens for a long time, as I've already mentioned several times. That happens for hundreds of years. Then, but every now and again, you'd get a knucklehead. You'd get somebody who took advantage of people. And, and that the, the setup does not change. It's still... 
here is somebody who's a judge. We'll read about him here in just a second. Who 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 is who is in put in position of being a judge, and that person takes advantage of of the populace, and this. But the setup's not changed. It's still the people and God, and to to get rid of the knucklehead, you just you had to seek God and you had to ask God to help us. Now God sometimes did it from in 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 ways that weren't. Expected. It would be somebody who was raised up, who was the son of a of a an illicit relationship. You know, these weren't like models of virtue, is what I'm trying to say. And I'm, but God would raise them up. It was unexpected. It was it was not always clear on on when God would do this, and pe- the people lived like that. And it came to a point they didn't want to live like that anymore, and they said, "We want a king." We don't want to live in a, in a society where judges are raised up by God anymore. We want a king, somebody like the other nations who rules over us. You see, they wanted a fundamental shift in the way their society functioned. Now, I'll, say, I'll step aside and say this. God had long prophesied that there would be a king. There was many, many prophecies that there would be a king in Israel. But I would submit this to you for your consideration, that when God prophesies a thing is going to be, doesn't necessarily mean He causes it. Like we see that right here in 1 Samuel chapter 8, the motivation to have a king, He obviously shows us, comes from the people. And He gives them what they desire. Let's read a few verses. So verse uh, chapter 8 of 1 Samuel is going to tell us about this transition. It came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel. That's a mistake. He appointed his sons judges over Israel. Samuel was a man like any of us, and he favored his sons over really what was the right thing to do, and it turned into a problem. We read about the same kind of thing with when Eli, was a man named Eli, who was a priest, appointed his sons, and, and they were not great guys either. Verse 2, Now the son of his firstborn was Joel, the name of his second son Abiah, and they were judges in Beersheba, and his sons walked not in the ways, in his way, Samuel's, but turned aside after lucre and took bribes and perverted judgment. So here's a problem. The son's got to go. This, they they got to go. But the way that the people decide to deal with this problem is, is the issue. So here, verse 4, All the elders gathered together themselves and came to Samuel, to Ramah, and said unto him, Behold, thou art old. And thy sons walk not in thy ways. Thou make us a king to judge us like all the nations. Now the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. Now Samuel should have said, Hey, you're right. These two guys got to go, and I'll put a stop to it. But that was not what exactly happened. He, he is bothered by the request for a king, but what he does is, instead of getting rid of his sons, he prays uh, to the Lord. And so we find verse 7, And the Lord said to Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people, and all that they say unto thee. This just tells us that sometimes we pray for things that are not what we ought to be praying for, and God sometimes will grant those things to teach us to be careful about what we ask for. To, to, to pray in such a way that we'd say, Lord, your will be done. Right. I'm seeking your glory here. This is the way I think I should go. But if you think it should go another way, then your will be done, and I'll submit to that. That wasn't how they prayed. We want a king. So God says to Samuel, okay, I'm going to give them a king. You're going to hearken unto all that they say. Then he says this, for they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me. Here he points out, that he has been reigning over them in the time of the judges. He is the king. They've not rejected you, Samuel. They've rejected me, he says at the end of that verse, that I should not reign over them. You see, they didn't want to live the way that they had been living. They wanted a king. They didn't want it to be themselves and God. Now, at this point, this reminds me of of a few things. But one thing is, a sermon I heard years ago, I think it was preached by Elder Sonny Huckabee, and I remember a few points of that sermon, but I remember him talking in in the beginning about the title of that sermon. And what he said was, 
This is a sermon about the far-off God, the far-off God. That stuck with me all this time. The far-off God. He began to talk about how in the Old Testament, God, in, the, in what He instituted, gave, gave the impression that He's the far-off God. So Moses would come to the burning bush and God would say, you stop, don't approach this bush, you stay back there, take your shoes off your feet, this is holy ground. When the, the, the tabernacle, when the, the method of worship was established for the children of Israel back in those days, like just a regular old person couldn't go up into the temple, you couldn't go into, into the, the holy place, and you couldn't go into the holy of holies, which is the, just a division of the, of the way the tabernacle was established. Only could you go in the first place I mentioned if you were the priest. But in that, in that particular room of the, of the tabernacle, I'm just going to describe this, try to plain language, it was divided into two rooms, and a priest would go into the first room every day. And, but you couldn't go in there unless you were a priest, so 90% of the population couldn't go into that particular room. And then the second room, only a single individual, a high priest, once a year could go in that room, you see. So, so you were forbidden, just as an average person, just us, would have been forbidden to go into the first one, and almost all the priests except one, all the priests except one were forbidden to go into the second room, you see. You couldn't see it. You would have never, you'd lived your whole life and never seen the Ark of the Covenant. One person saw that a year, and a lot of times it's the same person. So you think about, here's the high priest. He gets to go in there. He gets to see the Ark of the Covenant, the, the, the mercy seat, the, the place where God visits his people. He gets to see that, and he sees it, and maybe, he lived, maybe he's a priest for 20 or 30 years. He sees it 20 or 30 times, and he dies, and another person comes along. So you get in a century, you might get four people who get to see that thing. Everybody else never sees it, has no idea what it looks like other than just a, a, a description of words. The far-off God. You stay out there, and only the high priest can come in here. The far-off God. Here's the burning bush. Moses, you stay over there. Don't approach over here. And he preached a whole sermon about the far-off God. And then, at the end of that sermon, he sort of turned it around, and he said, the New Testament, it's the, it's the close-up God. It's When Jesus Christ died, you may recall, a very important thing happened. That the veil of the temple... Was, was, ripped, was torn in twain from top to bottom. A lot of symbolism in that, torn, it, that, that here this, this Ark of the Covenant was behind a curtain. And the, the priest could go in the first part, but only the high priest in the second part. And what God did when Jesus Christ died on the cross was he ripped that curtain, not, not from the bottom up, where man was standing from the top to the bottom. And here, suddenly, the Ark of the Covenant was, was, could be seen by anybody in that particular room. They weren't allowed to see it by the law of God, but what God was saying is, this is the old way. In the Old Testament, I'm the far-off God. But in the New Testament, I'm the up-close God. And so we find that here we find ourselves in sort of a similar situation in that we kind of go back to the days of the judges. Because in the days of the judges, it was the people and God and nobody in between. And they didn't like to live that way. That made them a little uncomfortable. They wanted somebody in between themselves and God. And they began to clamor and require that. So God says to Samuel, they didn't reject you. They rejected me. They don't want me as their king. They want somebody in between us. And so here God says, okay, tell them here's what's going to happen uh, let me read verse 8. So God continues to, to tell Samuel, explain what's going on here. He says, They rejected me from reigning over them according to all the works which they have done since I brought them up out of Egypt, even unto this day. Where they have forsaken me and served other gods, so do they also unto thee. <laughs> they continually were stumbled by worshiping other gods other than God. You see, if you worship the true God, that's a serious thing. And that's a thing that, that when you're worshiping the true and living God, that when you worship Him, you have to come to Him on His terms. But if you have a little God or you have a king, uh, you, you are worshiping now a God that you might be able to manipulate. You might be able, if you had a king between you and God and you said, God, put a king between us, 
And I want the king to sort of direct my life and help me understand what you want me to do. And I want the king to go out and fight our battles. I want the king to do all these things. But if I don't like this king, then what I'll do is, is, is we'll just assassinate him, get rid of him. If I don't like this king. Well, see, God is not like that. You can't take God off of his throne. He's going to, he's going to maintain his throne no matter what we do. And so now here the people, God's saying, these people are constantly struggling constantly forsaking me and engaging in themselves little gods here. And you think, what a ridiculous thing. Why would anybody do that? Here, I'm worshiping the true and living God. I've seen all of these miracles. Why would I put a little fictitious God right here in front of me? I've told you. Because I have some, I have some ability to, to manipulate this God right here. And if I don't like this one, I ditch him. If I don't like this one, I ditch him. But you see, if you don't like God, that's a you problem. And so we find that here, these people, God is saying they are constantly want these little gods because they don't want to serve me because to, to serve me requires them to come to me on my terms. And so we want a king. And God says, okay, give them a king. And then he tells them all of the things that this king that they want, that they think is their salvation, all of the things this person is going to do. And he describes how this person is going to tax them uh, in an exorbitant way. It's 10%. I wish our tax rate was 10%, don't you? He's, this person is going to tax them in an exorbitant way. He's going to take their crops and take their cattle and take their uh, uh, families and and they're going to be part of this government. All the, this is the, what you're asking for. And God explains all of that through Samuel. And he says at the end of that, verse 18, you shall cry out in that day because of your king. You're going to conclude at some point this was a mistake. You're going to cry out in that day because of your king, which he ha shall have chosen you, and the Lord will not hear you in that day. He explains all of that. Now, I hope that if somebody had come to me and said, here are these candidates for governor, and here is, here is, the, here is the current governor, and I'm not talking about the current governor. I'm talking about a, a situation we're all used to, voting for a governor. And we've got a governor who is God, and God is, rules the way God rules. But then we got this other person on the ballot, and you can vote for this person if you want, but here's what's going to happen. And you have enough insight to recognize that when God tells you, if you vote for this person, this is what's going to happen, you take him at his word. If you vote for this person, and here's what's going to happen. They're going to tax you. They're going to take your stuff. You're going to be, under, you're going to be oppressed. You're going to be sorry you ever voted for that person. I hope I would have enough sense to say, okay, okay, I'm sorry. I step back. I'll vote for you, God, not this guy. The people didn't. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, and they said, no, no, we will have a king over us. We insist on having this person reign over us in the chain of command between ourselves and you, God. <clears throat> I, I also have enough sense to recognize I have done the very same thing many times. Ask for something had a had a check in my spirit that probably I shouldn't be asking for this and went ahead and said, no, this is really what I want anyway. I, the same wickedness and sinfulness that we see displayed right here dwells in everybody's heart in this room. And Samuel heard all the words. I'm sorry, let me finish what the people said. Nay, we will have a king over us that we also may be like all the nations and that our king may judge us we want him to judge us. No more judges. We want this person to be the judge. And he says, so that's that. And, and that he may judge us and that he may go out before us and fight our battles. We want him to judge us and we want him to lead the army. We want a politician now to be able to stand in, in, the, in the chain of command between the people and God. Now, let me step aside and make this clear. This is not how our government works. We don't live in a theocracy. This, God did not establish in a direct way by, by the, the authority of His Word the way our country works. He did them. They were a legitimate theocracy. So they, that was the way their civil government worked. 
We are a theocracy in the sense we have a government. It is what it is. Governments are necessary to, to, to rein in the evildoer, Romans 13 will tell us. We have, we have a government. We have a theocracy in, in the sense that God is the king over, over everything. Yeah, right. Over everything. That's right. But here we're talking about a very special situation where God actually ruled and reigned and governed the, the affairs of these people. And what he's doing is he's looking forward to New Testament times with Jesus Christ over his church. That's what he's doing. But nonetheless, we see here that this is the situation they're in, and God would raise up a judge, as I've already described. And the people are saying, we don't want that anymore. What we want is the king, this man, to decide how to fight the battles and when to fight the battles. And we want this king to be the one to decide, how to judge us, to, to establish a, a method of, of judging over all of us. We don't want you to do it. We don't want to do it the way you've done it for the last four centuries. So in, that, in this thing, I see a, a, a couple things. One is we live in a time of the up-close God. Amen. You, the Bible calls us kings and priests. In the New Testament kingdom, that's what we are. You know, between you and Jesus Christ, absolutely nothing. Nobody is right. Absolutely nobody. So the youngest child, if you need help from the Son of God, you don't need a man. You don't need some man. Now, don't get me wrong. There is, in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. The Bible will tell us we can help each other. That's not my point. The idea is we're... When you, if you think that there is somebody between you and Jesus Christ, you're wrong. There isn't. You are a king and priest in the kingdom of God. He, the veil has been rent in twain from top to bottom. He is there for us. But what that also means is that there he, there he, is, there he is. And he gets to decide that he is the one who is the king over us. And so as much comfort as it may get us if we think, let me bring in a religious priest, and I'll go to this religious priest, as much comfort as that may, may give you, like, here's a man, and he's like I am, and, and, and he may tell me to, oh, to, to absolve this sin, you do this or that, and I can maybe say, well, you know, do I have to do this or that? Can I, can I, do, can I do these things? You know, we have a man here that I might be able to manipulate in a certain way, uh, the idea of that may bring us some comfort, but what you've got is you've got a man in between you, fictitiously placed, between you and God. And that may bring a certain level of comfort, but you've got a man between you and God. If you recall that David, when, when he numbered Israel and Joab said, don't do this, and God said, and David did it in his pride, Satan moved him to do that. And God said, okay, David, because you did that in your pride, you wanted to know the number, that was important to you. And you knew you shouldn't have done that. Because you did that, I'm going to give you a choice of how you can be chastised. And he, God gave him three options. And two of those options were, one was that God would send a pestilence, and two, that your enemies could have rule over you. That was two of the three choices. And he wanted none of those. David wanted no part in another uh, a foreign entity, in another king coming in invading the land. He said, if I'm going to be chastised, let me be chastised by God directly from Him to us. So now you find that we live in a time where by God's grace we have direct access to the Son of God. But we also have within our hearts the same sinfulness you see right here that from time to time, I don't think I like having direct access to the Son of God. One day it may seem like comfort, but another day it may seem, I don't think I want to approach unto Him. You remember when the Lord, and I'm closing with this, when the Lord told Peter to drop the net down and Peter hadn't caught anything and Peter drops the net down, he pulls up the net and it's full of fish. And Peter turns to the Lord and he's like, are you kidding me? He says, and you think he would have said, we're rich. Thanks, Lord. We're rich. What he said was, depart. Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. He wanted the Lord to go away because he recognized who he was and who God is. 
And that sometimes is very uncomfortable. But to go, to go through that is necessary. It, the, the answer is not, let me try to put an inter, a false intermediary between us. The answer is, is to let me acknowledge this of who I am and who He is. And let me maintain my direct access to Him. And in doing so, you will find that God is not only a righteous and holy judge, but also a gracious and merciful Redeemer. Amen. May God bless you. Amen. God bless you. Thank you, brother.